So let's get into some of the nitty gritty then of the proposals that actually emerged as the top three, right, Philippe? And I'm going to start off with you because we discussed at the launch how, you know, decades post apartheid, we have an economy that is still defined by mm -hmm. exclusion, current policy not achieving inclusion, not achieving empowerment in practice as well. That said, there was a submission with a focus on how we effectively foster economic inclusion and growth with the redistribution policies of the past having failed and often with negative consequences. So talk us through that proposal specifically. Yes, so this is a competition about inclusive economic growth. And what is interesting when, you know, at, at its most rudimentary level, when you ask people what, what do you understand as inclusive economic growth, people would think, okay, you're going to get a grant or a handout or, or, or you know, but that is not what e inclusive economic growth is, is, is about. It's not just about the sharing. It is also participating in what is being created. Mm. And, and it is also not, uh, you know, working in, 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 uh, as an employee, but also being part of those who decide what is to be produced. Um, and, and, and I think what, what, what struck me from, from, from this competition is also, when we talk about inclusive economic growth, we can't sit like, you know, uh, the Israelites waiting for Moses to arrive from the mountain and to give them, you know, the, what, 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 what the truth is and what you shall and shall not do. No, this is, this is, this is a conversation where the, the conversation itself needs to be inclusive. And that is what I also pick up from, from so many of the entries that, that, that we saw is that the conversation itself needs to be, and, and in a sense, this is just the beginning. Because if, you know, we, we can wait, you know, and we, we name some of the big names who, who contributed, uh, you know, to, what, uh, to the debate in South Africa, but, but, but we make, must make that debate ourselves. We need to see letters in, uh, you know, like in, in, in the olden days, you open the newspaper and there was a letter to the editor. But, you know, on, when you open up your, your social feed, you need to see letters from people on these precise debates mm. so that we can stimulate. We need to take the debate to the people. And, and, and that way you, you start fostering the conversation and we start to build an idea nationally as to what we in South Africa understand to be inclusive economic growth. Yeah. And I think that is, and, and hence the papers, yes, so, so they are ideas of the past, but also what, what struck me, and, and as, as judges, that is one of the things we, we, we looked at, is are there papers with novel ideas? Okay, so on that in, in that vein, yeah. I want to bring Michael in. Novel ideas, right? This paper focused on innovation policies, strengthening state capacity, creating a new narrative for progress, one of the papers that was submitted. Because of timing constraints, uh, given that we've only got 30 minutes to delve into all of this, I'm going to focus specifically on the innovation policy part of this research paper and ask you, does South Africa's national development plan, Michael, not provide adequate enough a template for this already? I mean, what was this paper proposing different to that, especially now where you've got something like Operation uh, Vulindlela tackling some of the most serious binding constraints with help of the private sector? Uh, you know, the economist uh, Mariana Mazzucato suggests that uh, what is important um, is that growth doesn't only have a, a rate it has a, a direction, mm. and that um, uh, we need to go along a particular path, and the way we should define that path, in her words, is with a mission orientation. And I think it is true that the National Development Plan, you know, one can point to, I think it has 119 commitments uh, in it, but I'm not sure whether it really contained a mission. Mm -hmm. that all South Africans can uh, buy into. Again, Operation Vulindlele is doing wonderful work addressing the problems that I mentioned earlier on, but I'm not sure whether kind of fixing ports and uh, 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 privatizing electricity generation also constitutes a kind of social mission mm. uh, that, that the country can unite behind. So uh, the, the paper you're referring to 
uh, recognized that um, it's not enough uh, to preach the gospel of innovation, but uh, you have to actually mobilize the flock, uh, in other words, the nation, uh, behind that gospel in a way that makes uh, a meaningful change uh, in people's lives. Yeah. Michael, with that mobilization agenda in mind, I mean, the collaborative spirit that we've got going now, something uh, we've got to leverage, and I almost want to say while it lasts here, but <laughs> let's be a bit optimistic, right? Um, from an investment perspective, the paper proposing greater investment in R&D to drive diversification into high value sectors specifically, all of which does not need to come from government alone. So what's the thinking around tax incentives, sector specific subsidies, ways to increase private sector investment in R&D so that we get this mobilization agenda going? I think when we talk about innovation, it's really important because it's, it's a kind of a truism that growth and innovation are essentially the same thing, right? The growth, there is growth because there is innovation. I mean, there's some growth you can have just because the population increases or the commodity prices can go up, but over the very long term, um, it is change that uh, drives growth. Now, we shouldn't confine innovation to being high-end, uh, uh, kind of tech industries or something like that. Uh, in any case, for a country like South Africa that, as Chris mentions, is somewhat inward looking, but is in another respect extremely uh, cosmopolitan and open to the world. The problem is that how do we capture those in uh, innovations for ourselves? Uh, let's not forget that one of the, the greatest South African innovators uh, took his innovations to the USA and became the richest man in the world. <laughs> it didn't really benefit South Africa much. So we shouldn't, which is a lesson that we shouldn't, when we talk about innovation and entrepreneurship, we shouldn't confine it to that. We need to bring it, connect it with, as one of the other papers mm -hmm. did, the township economy, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, innovations are not only about technology, they're also about social arrangements. They're also about the institutions we build and the markets we shape at a very local level uh, uh, that are connected with people's welfare. Yeah. And Mamukete, we've got to bring it back to basics as well, right? And that's what this paper did, because the reality is that this kind of investment in innovation would have to come hand in hand with an investment in human capital at the core. We've discussed uh, before, you know, how researchers are seemingly good at um, describing the inequalities that plague schools, but actually less successful in making any headway to solving for them. So how innovative an approach, uh, you know, adopted this time when it comes to how we start getting that education system on the right track? I think the, 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 the problems with the education system are well ventilated. Um, the solutions, or at least the suite of solutions, is, um, is, 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 is it's available and it's now it's become a political process. We've seen all the um, noise around the Bella Bill, um, for example. So to me, when it, when, it, when it comes to investing in human capital, I think when you look, up, uh, you look at education, you miss something. You miss the fact that there are adults in South Africa who are a lot less product productive right now than they would otherwise be. They might not be highly educated. Um, they, they, might, they might have been subject to, an educa to ed educational outcomes that we don't like uh, or that are suboptimal. But even at the level that they are, they're still being underutilized. So I think there is space to innovate around that. Um, and I think that's where um, the paper that Madoda, for example, wrote, which speaks about how do you use, um, you know, you, you increase the productivity of social grant recipients mm. um, um, by, ver by, by directing the cash towards um, improving their ability to create businesses, etc. These are people that are already there with the education levels that are there already, but they've proven already that they can be more productive and it's about enabling that productivity. So I think the education story, it, it is very well ventilated. The outcomes um, will only manifest in a generation, for example, but it doesn't mean that the workforce or we, they're not they're not a workforce at the moment, but they could be, but it doesn't mean that the people that we currently have 
in South Africa cannot be better utilized, mm. um, cannot be more productive. And that, you know, Michael speaks about innovation being around social arrangements, around policies. Um, it's, it's one of the things that came out of these papers, for example. This was a very intriguing proposal, which is why it ended up as one of the top three, which spoke about actually using people that are already there with the cash that are already there and just changing the policy around that a little bit yeah. to improve productivity. Um, and in that way, you get growth. So. Yeah, education, uh, we, we can, I, I think that, that that is well discussed. But these, this, is the, this is the bit that we were looking for, that, that little thing that we hadn't thought about.